Hello, this is uh, Mayor Brad Cohen, and I'm the mayor of the Township of East Brunswick, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about something that almost every resident uniformly has complained about, not only in East Brunswick, but basically being a resident in the entire state of New Jersey, and that is property taxes. But the property tax issue goes back many, many, many years, and so in order to really understand where we are, how we got here, I think it's critical that we take a little walk back in time and understand the history of property taxes here in New Jersey. So let's get started. Property taxes, just so that you know, go all the way back to the 1600s when New Jersey was under English rule. Uh, and personal property, as, as much as uh, real estate, was both taxed at that time. And that continued for years, decades, centuries, actually. It wasn't until after the American Revolution was over uh, and we were uh, established as a state somewhere between the years 1851 and 1875 that we actually developed a uniform assessment and the Assessors Association was developed and the local assessors, which were people who valued property in each particular town, uh, actually became part of uh, the New Jersey Constitution. Uh, and it was a requirement that that be in place so that locally local assessment could be done. It wasn't until 1884, some years later, that the State Board of Assessors was developed because they were in charge of evaluating and assessing both canal and railroad property. Remember, most modes of transportation at that time were waterways and railways. Not much changed in terms of property taxes over the years until we got to the period between the 1940s and the 1960s when there was a load of property tax exemptions that were put in place at the time. At that time, besides religious, educational, charitable, and cemetery properties, which had always been exempt from property tax. Through the 40s to 60s, business personal property was removed, business inventory, government property, historic property, youth organizations, fraternal organizations, pet cemeteries. There were many, many, many more added exemptions uh, that were allowed through that period of time. By the time we reached the year 2012, the total market value of all New Jersey property at that time was somewhere around $982 billion. Of that, $136 billion was exempt from property tax, meaning that close to 12% of the entire uh, property values in the state of New Jersey were exempt from taxes. So what are local property taxes? Local property taxes is a tax that is based on locally assessed property based and locally collected in order to support local and county government. That's it. That means it's supporting your municipal buildings and your municipal government. It's supporting your county government, your board of education, and therefore your public schools, your fire districts, and if voted upon by the public, you can cover um, open space, both local and county local space, but that must be voted upon by the members of the uh, municipality. In East Brunswick today, if you look at your tax bill, the one that you most recently got, roughly 62.5% of your taxes is earmarked for public schools, about 20% for municipal government, close to 13% for county government, and the balance is for your fire districts and open space. Now, the township is responsible for sending out those bills. We're basically a collecting agency for each of those different agencies. You could just as easily get a bill sent to you from the school district and they be paid to the school district. You get a bill from the county, you can get a bill from the fire department, but county regulation requires that all bills come out through the municipality, even though the amount of money from that bill that's being used for municipal purposes only is 20% of that total. Now, the tax is basically computed by taking the total budgeted revenue needs for each of those agencies and subtracting income from all other sources. That's the tax that needs to be raised. And so that becomes what we call the tax levy, the amount each year that the agency that we're talking about, that could be the Board of Education, the county, 
or the municipality uh, needs to raise in revenue needs. That's your tax levy. The tax base is the total value of all of the property in the municipality. If you take the tax levy, the needs, the revenue needs, and divide that by the total value of all property in the township, you come up with the tax rate. And when the tax rate is then applied to the value of your particular assessed property, that's how we calculate your tax bill. Now, in order to really understand the history of property taxes in New Jersey, it's critically important that you understand how New Jersey state income tax fits into all of this. And so I'm going to digress for a second to talk about that. As many of you know, or hopefully should know, there was massive migration to New Jersey in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And there were many, many reasons for that. One, it was overcrowding in the city. It was very expensive. There was a high crime rate. But as I just said a couple of minutes ago, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, New Jersey deliberately put through a lot more exemptions, especially business exemptions, that made New Jersey a great state to leave if you were living in New York. It had a, all of the things that we basically look at states like Florida and Texas now for who don't have state income tax and are business friendly. That, believe it or not, was what people thought about New Jersey in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Add to that the fact that under the Eisenhower administration, there was a huge amount of money that was put, put into our transportation needs. And so the Turnpike extension allowed more people to live in the suburbs and make commuting into the city possible. So with that, there was a massive level of migration into New Jersey. And as a result, we saw a lot more families living here. They had a lot more kids and therefore a lot more people in the public schools, which grew by um, logarithmic amounts. In 1973, the then governor, Cahill, attempted to institute a progressive state income tax. Now, progressive means that it's a tax that's based on your ability to afford, meaning the more that you could afford, the more you have to pay, as opposed to a regressive tax, something like sales tax, which disproportionately affects people making less. If you're both buying the same item and somebody making less money is paying the same amount of tax as someone making more, that amount on their income compared to someone greater um, is a more of a hardship. That's a regressive tax. Um, and generally, Republicans tend to prefer, prefer regressive tax and, and uh, Democrats tend to be more in line with progressive tax. So considering that Governor Cahill, Cahill was a Republican, it was quite unusual that he was proposing a progressive state income tax. And the main reason he was looking to do that was simply because of the effect that this massive influx of kids on the school systems had caused Board of Education budgets to go up so high that people were complaining about, guess what? such a large portion of their property taxes going to public education. Now, it was wildly unpopular in the Republican Party, and as a result of his suggesting a progressive income tax, Governor Cahill, when he ran for re-election, didn't even win the primary in the Republican primary. And so two years later, we now have a new governor, uh, and that was Brendan Byrne, who was able to actually establish the first time New Jersey ever had a state income tax. And again, the purpose of that tax was primarily as a way of giving property tax relief to individuals in town in the state who were complaining about the massive percentage of their taxes that had gone to public school education. The problem is that with the tax going through, uh, the amount that actually trickled down to the schools was very minimal and people were very unhappy that now they had a state income tax and yet they didn't see any great change in their property tax bill. So as a result, uh, in the 1980s, the New Jersey legislature put through a bunch of changes um, that allowed individuals in specific target groups um, some sort of property tax relief. So that's really where you see the history of the homestead rebate, the senior freeze, the New Jersey saver program, the veterans, senior citizen and disabled citizens property tax deductions, all specifically designed to try to take and ease the burden of property taxes on groups that it hit the hardest. 
By 1990, we now had a new governor in Governor Jim Florio. And on top of the fact that he was facing continued complaints about property taxes, we were in the middle of a recession. And any time there's a recession, there's decreased revenues that comes into both state and local budgets. And as a result, his answer uh, was to put through a massive tax increase on state income taxes. At the time, he called for a $2.8 billion increase, which was the largest increase in state income tax throughout the entire country at that time, which was designed to help fully fund the schools, to plug budget deficits. Uh, it still involved a lot of, of cuts to uh, state government so that he could make the budget actually work. Um, but it was wildly unpopular. And anybody that was living at the time probably still remembers the riots and the um, rallies that took place as a result of the tax and the Florio 3 and 93 type of chants that people went around talking about uh, at that time because the tax again was so unpopular. Uh, in fact, by the time uh, he ran for re-election, he lost in a squeaker to Christine Todd Whitman, who took over in that year from the Democratic Party and brought along with it a change in the legislature, which uh, moved to a Republican-controlled legislature, something they hadn't seen in close to 30 years. And her promise at that time was to roll back those tax increases, which she did, as most of us now know, on the backs of raiding a good portion of the uh, pension money that was uh, destined and should have been destined for uh, enrollees in the pension plan and was the beginning of what we now know as our uh, pension crisis. Started with her, but every governor since her has really not funded that pension. But the net effect of the Florio tax freeze had a chilling effect on legislators and future governors. It, in fact, it's still so to this day. Nobody, it is the holy grail, nobody wants to touch state income taxes. And so the state, when it has budget gaps that it needs to meet, will find any possible way of trying to raise funds, but they dare not touch New Jersey state income taxes because of the Florio effect. So. We also have to keep in mind that one of the large reasons for this problem is the whole idea about how um, we go about funding our public schools. And so again, I'm gonna digress just for about a minute on public school funding. As many of you know, one of the pride and joys of what's going on in New Jersey right now is that despite all of uh, the negative things you hear about, our public schools still rank number one in the country. That's not without work and it's not without a huge amount of input from administrators and teachers who commit themselves to public education and support from the NJEA and other organizations who pride themselves on making sure that we have the highest standards for our students. And so, yes, we do pay our teachers well and we get results for that investment. Um, School funding uh, for New Jersey, again, goes all the way back to the institution of the state tax to begin with. But by 1985, it was clearly evident that with property taxes primarily funding public schools, despite the state income tax, there was a disproportionately bad effect on people that came from areas where property taxes or there wasn't a very large tax base. So inner city schools just simply didn't get the amount of need uh, and the amount of, of, of investment in public education that more suburban districts did. So the state um, took it upon itself to figure out what they thought was a more progressive and fairer way of funding public schools and developed this in 1985 under the Abbott School decision, um, which uh, called for Abbott School districts, meaning that of the state money that was going to be uh, provided to public schools, it would not be divided evenly. Towns and cities and municipalities that um, were in greater need or um, uh, had um, more needs had greater proportion of the money than towns that were more affluent, um, where we uh, saw more of a reliance on property taxes. By 2007, the Abbott name itself was removed 
and the New Jersey School Development Authority took over the actual funding uh, formula and distribution for public education. So what we used to be called Abbott districts are now basically called SDA districts, but they're essentially the same thing. If you look at the last year for which we have good statistics, 2016-17 school year, if you look at the national average for the percent of property tax that is used to fund public schools, across the nation it averages about 45 percent. In New Jersey, it's about 50 percent. So um, we do considerably spend more money in property taxes uh, on a whole on public education. But there's a very wide range because of the SDA formulas, meaning like towns such as East Brunswick or um, more affluent districts are going to be paying much higher than 50 percent, whereas towns that are less affluent will be paying much less. So while the average is 50 percent, when you look at your tax bill, as you know, it's 62.5 percent because under the SDA formula, East Brunswick is considered more affluent, affluent and therefore um, it's expected that, that we could contribute more to public education, again, than schools that are less. Uh, today, if you look at the SDA formulas, there's 60% of all of the state aid that goes to public education goes to the 31 SDA districts in the state of New Jersey, and there's somewhat less than, little less than 600 public school districts in the entire state of New Jersey. So that gives you a sense of how the, how the money is, is divided. Now, when we talk about property taxes, if you didn't pay property taxes the way we did based on the net value of your real estate, meaning your house and your land and the improvement, which is almost always your house, there are alternatives to property taxes that are done throughout the country. In one instance, we have local option sales, income, or payroll taxes. You see that across the country in certain places. New York, for instance, has a New York City tax. The city has a sales tax uh, that's added, and, um, and you have income tax that's paid uh, to New York City. Uh, you could do tobacco taxes and fuel taxes and alcohol taxes or public utility taxes. There are other ways of finding money uh, to come into uh, to, or to, as alternatives to property taxes. But if you look at our present situation right now in most municipalities, 98%, uh, 98.8% 98 to be exact, of all local tax uh, comes in from property taxes, not from any of those other sources. And the state of New Jersey actually does not allow local government to levy income, wage, or sales taxes. What it does allow for a municipality is we are allowed to institute a hotel tax. Um, and in certain towns or cities throughout the state of New Jersey, you can institute a parking tax. The other alternative to property taxes is um, state revenue replacement programs. And I'm gonna spend a couple minutes talking about that because it's critically important that we understand that. Right now, these replacement programs are otherwise known to towns as state aid, They're as if you're waiting and it's at the whim of the state to give that to us. That is totally the wrong term. And this state aid that the, t the state refers to is actually revenue replacement programs that were meant to replace revenues that came into a municipality that was taxed by the municipality and collected by the municipality from public utilities. And it dates back to the 1800s. It's actually the second largest source of income to the municipality after property taxes. And its goal was to prevent the increase in property taxes. It was to keep a lid on increases. It was never meant to decrease your taxes. It was just a way to prevent taxes from going up so much every year. Of the two state aid programs, um, well, let me talk about the first. The first is called the Energy Tax Receipt Property Tax Relief Program. We otherwise call that Energy Tax Receipts or ETRs. It's a direct descendant of local utility taxes that were collected, like I said, all the way back to the 1800s. And they were made up of two taxes. First was a public utility franchise tax, was a percentage of the gross energy receipts based on the number and miles of lines 
that, of public utilities that you had within the township and the number of right-of-ways that were developed in a town. So if a town developed more, it needed more lines, and ordinarily there would be a tax paid by the utility company to the municipality for those lines. And it was an easy calculation. You took the total number of miles of lines in your town divided by the total number of miles throughout the state, and that's the percentage of the gross receipts that was due to the municipality. And up until 1980, they were paid to the municipality um, directly. The other tax was the gross receipts tax. It was a tax paid in lieu of property taxes for the utility company for the use of highways, roads, and streets, and other property that they needed, whether that would be um, stations or, or um, energy grid areas that they would ordinarily pay taxes on. That was the gross receipts tax. Both of them together, together now are referred to as energy tax receipts. By the 1940s, the state was already trying to figure out how they could dip into some of those funds um, because they needed it to try to plug some of their own budget deficits. But by 1980, at the request of the utility companies, they asked that the state take over collection of all of these um, energy tax receipts. Why? Because it felt it was too difficult at that time for them to be sending checks out to five or six hundred different municipalities and doing the calculations. Now, of course, that was 1980. We all know that today, an average high schooler, schooler with minimal um, Excel uh, spreadsheet skills could probably figure that out in five milliseconds and divide up the number per municipality and collect it and connect it to a uh, ETR and transfer that money to the township. But 1980 was a little bit different and the the utilities didn't want to be sending out that many different checks, so they let the state take over being the collecting agency for all of those taxes, and then the state would return that money to each municipality minus a management fee. Um, and that continued for a while, but of course as the state had to do what it can to fill its own budget gaps, and I don't mean this in a bad way, as state government grew, they cost of running government went up and programs increased and so pay to more employees all of their 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 budgets went up but keep in mind nobody wants to touch income tax for the state so what the state did would always try to figure out how they could take some of that money to use for themselves now by the 1990s that was an age of deregulation in the energy industry and there was a lot of changes and so that whole negotiation between the uh, municipalities and the states um, came up with some conclusions and some changes to the way in which the money was distributed. First, they capped the amount of money that the state could keep in management fees for managing the energy tax receipts, along with Comptra, which I'll get to in a second. And there was also supposed to be an annual increase in the amount that each municipality got for its energy tax receipts and its Comptra, which again, I'll talk in a couple of seconds, by what they called an implicit price deflator. Basically, it was a mechanism to make sure that each town got um, a higher level of those energy receipts um, each year. Thirdly, what they also put in and negotiated in was a poison pill, which basically said that if the state ever failed to give not only your energy tax receipts, but the increase that the towns were entitled to, that failure to do that would automatically invoke the, invoke the poison pill and the state would forfeit its ability and authority to collect the money of, from the energy companies, it would return back to the municipality to collect on its own. But the state did figure out a way of getting around that, and that gets me to COMPTRA, which is an acronym for Consolidated Municipal Property Tax Relief Act Program, or COMPTRA. What that is, is a consolidation of a lot of other taxes that municipalities were ordinarily entitled to. They're made up of the financial business tax, the business personal property tax replacement program, the railroad class two property tax, corporation business tax on banking corps, and state pilot programs was kind of all rolled up into Comptra. But the problem was the poison pill that I referred to was only placed on the energy tax receipts, not Comptra. And so by 2002, what the state ended up doing was it, was it would reduce your amount of Comptra by the increase it would give you in your energy tax receipts so that 
you basically stayed flat when you were really supposed to be getting an increase, the municipality was supposed to be getting an increase in both. Um, but in, by holding us flat, the state kept that difference. By 2008, they stopped trying to even do that any longer. And so that was the first year that the state actually reduced Comptra by a greater amount than it increased the energy tax receipts. And so the towns actually ended up getting less money. By 2020, this year, we already got our um, notification from the government, from the state government, on what we're getting in both state aid and Comptra. Comptra were down to zero, so the state government can't reduce us below zero. And our energy tax receipts, otherwise known as state aid, which it really isn't, um, totals about $4 million each year, which for the last decade has been pretty much flat. Um, everybody right now in the middle of this financial crisis is worried about whether or not towns are going to get their state aid. Let's first of all just stop calling it state aid, it's energy tax receipts. Um, because this is what, again, second largest source of income for most municipalities. If you got your energy tax receipts and your Comptra and your full state funding, if that had been going on all along, there would probably have been minimal to no tax increases on the municipal level for years, but that just hasn't happened. So let's kind of get back to the state history of property taxes. Um, after Whitman um, moved on to uh, work in Washington after George W. was elected president, we had McGreevy and then a series of interim uh, governors and property taxes just didn't seem to hit the front page. But it kept growing and growing, it really is never solved. Um, but by 2007, when Governor Corzine was now in office, there was a big flurry uh, to get back to this idea of doing something to um, help ease the burden on residents in terms of their uncontrollable increase in property taxes. So in 2007, he convenes a citizens convention made up of various different groups that all had a special interest in keeping and reducing property taxes. And there was a heavy influence of people that come from disproportionately poor um, communities because the tax affects them to an even greater degree than the rest of us. But everybody was represented. And what came out of that convention was a bunch of changes that were helpful. Um, the problem is we didn't enact all of them or act on all of them. Some of those things included a property tax credit for people that made under $100,000, amounted to about $1,100 per household at that time. There was a benefit to seniors that amounted to about $1,200 per household. They put together a shared services commission designed to try to get communities to share not only services, but uh, municipal services, but school services and county services. That really never got off the ground. Um, and then um, they put together uh, and suggested that they put in a county school superintendent for each county. And the goal in putting in county superintendents was to regionalize school districts at that time, because they recognized that 595 some odd districts was duplicative, and um, to try to get rid of the K through 12 districts, to try to merge them into something larger. Um, and of course, that would depend upon public voting, um, which in the end, never ended up happening. Very little regionalization took place at that time. Very few, few K, uh, school districts that were less than K to 12 ever merged with much larger districts. And what we ended up having was another layer of bureaucracy and more superintendents with salaries and benefits. And the purpose for which it was put in never really um, materialized. Also at the time, was a goal of trying to eliminate um, civil service barriers that made it difficult for towns to talk to other towns about regionalization and shared services and consolidation. That also never really um, got too far. Um, we put in a state comptroller, which was designed to try to eliminate a lot of government waste, which had some success. Um, there was a lot of work done on trying to eliminate abuses in the pension systems. That was also done. Um, the other thing that was done was a user-friendly uh, budget, local budget, which was uh, designed so that CFOs and towns can provide uh, the electorate uh, and residents with a budget that would be easier to understand. 
Unfortunately, that kind of ended up going the same way that the public question does, where there's a, um, a, a second question that's user friendly. It wasn't so user friendly. If you had a good financial background, it probably was easier to understand. And one of the problems is, you know, as residents, we don't generally look up budgets. We should be doing that, taking on a little bit more responsibility on our own um, because it is all out there. Um, and with information today, it's a lot easier to access. So it was successful, but I think it's a little bit hard to understand without a, a little bit of a financial background. Um, in addition, they put in a 4% cap on property taxes, which today sounds like a, a minimal type of thing considering where interest rates are today. But you have to understand that in the 1990s, uh, property taxes were going up on average 6 to 7% per year. So dropping to 4% was actually a big change and, um, and welcomed one. Uh, in addition, the conference put together um, a, a, a request uh, that local boards of education work with their uh, negotiations with teachers and um, unions to try to uh, get a, a um, health care and costs uh, uh, partly shared by uh, the by the uh, employees themselves didn't really go very far. Um, it was a good idea. Ultimately, it did end up getting enacted, but later. Um, and then they put in public school um, efficiency standards as a basis and qualifier for collecting any of the school state aid. Just uh, don't get confused with the word state aid. State aid for schools is the amount of money that the state's responsible for providing to schools. State aid for a municipality, I already told you, has been completely confused with what it really is, which is energy tax receipts and Comptra. By 2010, we now have Governor Christie, who made a giant and valiant effort at trying to contain and work on property taxes by putting in what he called his 31 point toolkit for municipalities to help keep control of taxes and within that toolkit were some really important changes that did actually make a big difference first of all he lowered the property tax levy cap from four percent to two percent so that if the school board or a town wanted to go out with more than a two percent increase it would require the public to agree there were things that were excluded um, because there was no way that towns or schools could have control over certain exempts. So things that were exempt from the 2% cap were pension costs and health care costs and certain other costs which towns have abs uh, natural disasters, things that we would uh, ordinarily have absolutely no control over. There was also a lot of pension reforms that were done through the toolkit and funding objectives. We also uh, saw that through the toolkit, they required that all state, local, and school employees pay into their health care and pension costs, which changed for the first time the whole negotiating format because once uh, employees have to actually start paying into their health care plans, now all of a sudden both the employer and the employee are on the side of trying to find a health care plan that's maybe a little less expensive because now we're both on the hook for any major increases. Um, the 2% cap was also placed on arbitration with state, local, and school bargaining units. And then finally, there were massive cuts to state departments uh, and different state programs, which will play out later um, in, in terms of some of the uh, things we're facing today. So where do we stand in 2020 when it comes to property taxes? Well, first of all, state pensions are still underfunded. And while that started under Governor uh, Whitman, um, no governor since her administration was ever able to really fully fund um, that pension deficit. Uh, in large part, uh, many of the reasons for that date back to an assumption that the pensions would make much more money than, um, than it actually did in the market. And so um, they felt that it would be fair to take money from that since if you expected to make more money uh, than what the budget office said you would be able to make, then the difference would be something that the state felt they had access to. The problem is markets are markets and you have good years and you have bad years. And so in the end, when you hit the bad years, the uh, fund ended up being grossly underfunded. Um, Governor Murphy made a valiant effort the last couple of years at trying to um, put us back on track to pay for some of those unfunded uh, pension deficits. But uh, with the current crisis that we're in right now, that again has been put on hold. 
um, the 2% arbitration cap that was put in under Christie um, has expired. And so all public unions are looking with their bargaining units to come to the employers, whether that be the state or the municipal government, and are now free to bargain for more than 2% uh, salary hikes. And again, um, without any uh, state mandated cap, um, this is something that we in municipal government and in state government simply have to, to deal with. We're also in the middle of a current financial crisis. And that financial crisis, whether it's a recession or a depression or whatever you want to call what we're in right now, is almost always fueled and its, it, its greatest problem comes in the fact that there's massive revenue losses coming into both the state and to the townships. And as a result, um, we have uh, already seen from the state that through the year 2021, there's an expected $10 billion revenue shortfall. Um, on the municipal government, um, it's proportionately less, but it's still significant. So, you know, what has the state done in the past when it comes to dealing with these type of revenue shortfalls? Um, they, you know, it's very predictable things that they're going to do. They won't increase state income tax, that I can promise you. Um, but what they will do is several things. One, they'll borrow money. Um, if any of you have been following the state uh, legislature right now and the governor, they're looking to borrow close to 9.9, .9, close to $10 billion to make up for this revenue shortfall um, and bond for that and pay that back over, over time. And whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing, but that is one mechanism that the state um, is utilizing to try to help um, plug some of that revenue gap. Um, what they've done in the past, again, uh, was shortchange the pension. And uh, I don't think anybody's deliberately done anything like that. I think that uh, as state government grew and everybody tries to do what they can to provide all the programs and services and we, we, we all want as residents, both through the state and, and through municipal government, um, the reality is that there's only so many sources of income. And so, again, um, part of the budget deficit is going to be uh, placed by not uh, contributing the rightful amount that we really should be to the pension system. State has notorious for raiding other funds, um, whether that was uh, not fulfilling the amount of money it's supposed to be giving to uh, state aid for schools, um, transportation trust fund, you know, these are all funds that um, really was the reason why when Governor Christie recommended a gas tax, people were so um, uncertain about that because they were afraid that, that uh, the government would just see that as another way of a slush fund for paying for, um, I shouldn't really use the word slush fund, but um, just a way of plugging gaps in the uh, state budget uh, from, uh, from funds that were readily available. The one that... Um, that uh, I'm clearly concerned about right now uh, is Assembly Bill 1049, which was just passed about two weeks ago. And on the outset, it seems like a, a very logical, easy bill that why would everybody not agree? What it does is it allows the state government to take money from each municipality's housing trust funds. Housing trust funds are a uh, source of, of money that is provided by developers in a town and it's contributed to this fund in order to fund affordable housing. Um, so if a developer is building a whole lot of homes, X amount of dollars or an X percent needs to be set aside into a township's housing trust fund so that the township can use that money to provide for affordable housing. It's an obligation that we have to try to help those who are in need of housing and just simply can't afford to live in New Jersey, which isn't frankly difficult to understand. New Jersey is an expensive state. The problem is that under this bill, what it asks for um, or what it's requiring or allowing essentially is for the state to access the, trans the, uh, housing, corp the housing trust fund money in order to take foreclosed houses in your, in your township and take them off the books, buy that, and the town would then get a two for one credit on the affordable housing obligation that it ordinarily has um, each time the uh, town is given an affordable housing number uh, that it has to build. Third round was just uh, announced back in 2015. The problem is that that's not a new bill. That bill goes back six years. Um, and at that time, um, it was done with the attention of trying to help meet um, affordable housing 
credits. By 2015 was really when um, the courts ordered uh, settlements with all of the townships for affordable housing obligations that they would be obligated to for the 10 year period of 2015 to 2025. But by 2020, most of those settlements are done already. So the question is why is the state looking to access housing trust fund money for um, housing credits when towns have already settled? Any new um, affordable housing units would have to go for settlements beyond 2025. Um, and our fear as mayors and as leaders in municipalities is that just becomes the next source of money for the state to go after when it needs to plug budget gaps. Um, now, six years ago, there was an amendment that was added to that bill that required that townships have the right of first refusal, that if the state wants to come in and utilize that money, the town needs to know about it first and has the right to refuse it. That amendment was pulled from the assembly bill that was voted on two weeks ago, and it stands as is. So while I don't have a problem, certainly would love the two-for-one credit for our obligation after 2025, that'd be great. Um, but maybe the town doesn't want to build something in an area where there's a foreclosed piece of property. Maybe there's other affordable housing area in that side of town or that section of town that we don't want to utilize. Or maybe the town is already utilizing its housing trust fund money to do some sort of affordable housing project. And next thing we do is wake up one morning and it's been deleted because the state now has access to it. So again, this idea of the state coming in and having access to money makes most mayors a little weary. So again, if the bill's gonna go through, it needs to have the amendment put back in that allows the town right of first refusal and the ability to have um, control over how that money is utilized. The fourth thing that the town does, uh, that the state does um, when it's looking to try to fill its budget gaps is do what it's been doing and take our energy tax receipts, our Comptra, and not fully fund schools. And again, I don't think anybody's doing this in a mean-hearted manner. Nobody's lining their pockets. There's not graft that's going on. It's just that the cost of running government is expensive. And there's lots of programs and, and, and qualified people that we want working for us, and it costs money. You want the best schools in the country? You mean you have to pay your teachers. It costs money. And so I don't think that there's a, um, an ill intent, but this is what happens when everybody is vying for um, limited resources to try to provide as many services as people want. Um, so if we had our complete funding for school state aid and we had the funding that we were supposed to have been entitled to along with the increases to our energy tax credits and our Comptra, I could promise you that looking at what that amount of money totals, you would likely have not seen property tax increases for the last decade. Towns would not have had to do that. And that's what that money was meant to be there for. But when the state then uses it for their own needs, towns have no other op op option to make those expenses other than to rely on its only source of income. 98.8% comes from property taxes. So this is, you know, this is where we stand today. Um, what's the take home? Well, there's this constant struggle between municipal government and state government on a limited pool of funds. Uh, and, and, and again, it's all meant with good intention. I don't think the state is looking to try to do anything other than provide for all the things that, that we need and want as residents. Um, you know, the reality is that when you poll residents, and we do that every election year, um, it's typically done fairly regularly, and you ask the public, would you rather have more services and pay more taxes, or would you rather have less services and pay less taxes? 60% to 40%, 60-40 by the way in any election would be considered a landslide, 60% say that they would favor less services and less taxes until we go to take away one of the services that you want. You wanted, uh, and we saw that this year. So people want twice a week garbage pickup. Well, we've reduced it part of the year to once a week. People come and tell me, 
oh, I would pay for that, having it twice a week, but maybe your neighbor wouldn't. There's another person who wants me to spend more money on roads, but your neighbor doesn't. State government, we just went through a whole crisis right now. Do you see how long people had to wait on motor vehicle lines or they had to wait to get their unemployment checks? There's not enough people working there. The systems are 30, 40 years old. They don't work. And so we have massive, massive problems. Department of Transportation, Department of Environmental Protection. You know, all of these services that we need as residents. Um, yeah, under the Christie government, he wiped out almost all of the Department of Transportation. You go into that building right now, you could roll a bowling ball down that, uh, the, down the hallway. There's nobody there. And there's no surprise then when you call the department and you can't get an answer or work that needs to be done is done over a year's period of time. We were promised that Route 18 work was gonna be done in 2017. It's 2020 and I see no chance that that's gonna be done in the next year or two. This is what happens when you cut services. So we as a people, as a population, as residents, we really need to decide you know, what do we really want? Do we want all these services and be willing to pay for it? Or are we in a position where we don't want it and we want all of this tax relief because it's gonna be very difficult to do both. So, you know, this is uh, my pitch on where we stand in terms of how we got to the property tax problem that we're in right now. There are lots of people who have all different ideas for solutions. This is not easy. If it was so easy, it would have been done already. But I hope that um, it gives you a little bit of a, a sense of where we are, how we got there. Um, I'll save a future segment for my ideas on how we think, how I think um, we can solve some of those problems. But in the meantime, I'm going to go back to the words of Benjamin Franklin and that in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes.